You are listening to Nabil Usman and Stephen Imelego at Kabafest. You're welcome back. This is still now breakfast. My name is Stephen Imediegu here with Nabila Usman and together we're bringing you another conversation on Now Breakfast right here at Kaaba Fest 2024. We're speaking this morning with Hawa Saleh, a dead... A Hawa dead Saleh. Is Miss, Saleh cool? Miss, <laughs> <laughs> Miss Saleh, please forgive me. Um, I'm an Igbo boy based in Lagos and uh, we are affected. But uh, Hawa is a, is a writer, a poet, and a tea maker. Her literary works have appeared in The Weight of Years, an Afro anthology of creative nonfiction, the AK Review, Agbowo Magazine, Lolway, and more. She's also the author of How to Practice Forgetting, a poetry collection that explores the world through the body, and it's available uh, online as well. Hawa is a journalist and currently is with Human Angle Media. She also produced the documentary Surviving Long COVID, and it aired at this year's Kaaba Fest. It aired just uh, yesterday, actually, day one of Kaaba Fest, and uh, Hawa, I guess we'll, we'll open up with that, right? Let's talk about your documentary. You were the center of that conversation. You shared what was a very personal experience even if it's an experience that um, across the world, because of how widespread COVID was, we've been hearing about long COVID. So speak to us on what it was like to bear your uh, dealings with this, this disease. Uh, hello. Um, so uh, the reason why I had to speak, okay, first of all, this is a documentary series. So the long COVID part is just the first part of the series. Um, well, the... Speaking out about it, uh, it wasn't really an easy decision because uh, I had to keep going back and forth. Do I really want to come up with my story? But then I decided that if I wanted people to trust me with something that personal, I have to lead by example. Uh, so I decided to come up with my story. And about living with long COVID, uh, it's actually a terrible experience. There's no other way to put it, um, especially with the healthcare system, with the you know medical gaslighting. There's also the personal aspect of it, um, trying to survive and do all these other things with um, such little energy, a lot of pain. It's quite, it's quite the journey. Now, this is a undoubtedly a journey that is very personal, and um, I say this because. Till today, there are people who will tell you that COVID is not a thing. Um, and I, I look at those people. I was fortunate to not experience it, but I wasn't fortunate enough to not know anybody who didn't experience it. I lost a friend, a very dear friend uh, to COVID. You your documentary, talking about your pain, your struggles, and how long um, your, the, your path to recovery was, what do you think it will do to the Nigerian who would typically not believe these sort of reports about uh, viral diseases, pandemics and endemics. How do you think it will go about changing the mindset of the Nigerian, especially the Nigerian in healthcare? Um, I really don't think you can change anybody's mind. I think what you can do is try to create as much awareness because for some people it's come from a place of ignorance and some people's others they're set in their ways. There's no amount of documentaries, no amount of evidence, no amount of research the amount of science is going to convince them. And if science can convince you, I don't think I can. Um, but what I do hope to do with the documentary series is bring up, because it's supposed to document chronic illnesses, rare diseases, including mental health, uh, chronic conditions. So I really do want to bring up room for conversation, like what happened here, and also kind of make people aware be capable of taking up space regardless of what people believe or not believe it makes it harder when people don't believe but it's important to just um to just do your best and then the people that want to listen will listen and those that don't want to there's nothing you can do about it yeah. so i i'd like us to backtrack because i realized that we started this conversation sort of from the middle for our listener right uh, there's a question of what long covid is and how it has impacted you, how you've been living with it. So if you could share that for, with us. Uh, long COVID is, um, it's something that happens after COVID usually. It's usually diagnosed if you're still experiencing symptoms or come up, pop up in new symptoms two to three months 
post COVID. That's after you have um, tested negative for the virus. So um, there are a lot of theories. Some people believe it triggers dormant viruses in people's bodies. Some people believe it does. We just way too many damage um, for people to. For it, there's too much, so it kind of becomes like an autoimmune disease where your body is attacking itself. Um, and so there isn't, unfortunately, there's no cure for autoimmune diseases. And how long COVID is diagnosed is a bunch of symptoms. So there's no particular test that you can go and do and say, oh, uh, there's what is coming out of long COVID. Uh, we don't have a test right now because somebody can come up with neurological, cardiovascular, um, gastrointestinal symptoms that you can have like symptoms ranging across all organs of your body. So you have to get different specialists to treat what they can. Um, and about it for me, um, I have symptoms like brain fog, uh, I have chronic fatigue, uh, I have chronic pain, um, and a lot of other tiny symptoms like shortness of breath, um, kind of like uh, unable to do much because the moment you do one activity, you feel exhausted, you feel drained, and you're incapable of like, you just, uh, it kind of just changes. It feels like somebody divided my body into three with my brain capacity my energy and everything and just give me like one part back that's what it feels like living currently in this body mm. you're still on to now breakfast coming to you live from kaba fest 2024 in the city of kaduna i'm steven imediagu here with my co-host nabila usman and together we're speaking to hawa saleh she is um the producer of a documentary series the more recent iteration of it being surviving long covid and we're talking about the disease, what it has done, and what it continues to do, and the journey towards recovery. The other thing about you, uh, Ms. Saleh, is that this is not your only story. You, like us, are a journalist, but you're also a poet and uh, a creative. I, I see that you are dressed as a tea maker. And there's a tea maker. And a lawyer. And we all know what lawyers are. Ah, ah, Troublemaker. It's not me that said it. <laughs> well... Um, all these hats on you, do you ever feel pressure? Do you ever feel like I, I'm, I'm really doing too much? Uh, yes, I do feel overwhelmed uh, because like sometimes I'll make tea and it take me like months to even get to package it. Um, yeah, I, I do feel overwhelmed, but not because of what I'm doing. I love what I'm doing. That's why I'm doing them. I'm, I'm someone that I need to be interested in something and that's why I have a lot of other interests that I do. Um, yeah, so I do feel overwhelmed sometimes, especially because I don't have the energy to do most of the things that I want to do the way that I want to do it. But I love what I do, so I think that that kind of makes things easier mm. to deal with. Which of these identities would you say you're more inclined towards? Hmm. I think... Um, huh. uh, I really love making tea. But I, I think I'm more of a poet. That that's the one. <laughs> I, that's no, the one. Uh, that's it's the poetry, one. I think. It's okay. writing. Uh -huh. yeah, it's art. That makes, okay. Mm -hmm. For me, that makes more sense. <laughs> Stephen is here thinking about the tea he's going to drink. But l let's explore that, that identity a little more, your poetry. You are particularly a performance poet, right? And I'm... I, I know that you have written poetry. Um, Stephen read out the different places where you've been published. But I'm interested in your style of performance. There's a way that performance poetry in Nigeria is a, there's a specific way. There's a specific way. Mm. There's a specific way. And I'm saying, and I'm saying. Oh, my goodness. Right? <laughs> you catch the, dr the drift already. Yeah. Um, it's like saying uh, this is not a cultural poem but it's a cultural poem, right? The style is essentially the same. And if you listen to some of the performance poets in places like America, you immediately see where performance poets in Nigeria are drawing their inspiration. Yours is different. Is that deliberate? Yeah, I, I, I found out that the best way to do everything is just bring yourself, like be yourself. Uh, I really believe in being authentic. But I think when I started to, I really made that mistake because that's all the, um, uh, the example that I saw around me. But it was my friend. I can remember the first time I recorded a video, I sent it to uh, an audio I released, uh, for, for spoken word. And um, I sent it to my friend Angela and she was like, I like this, but this isn't you. I, I can't see you in it. Well, how don't you, why don't you try to use your voice? And that was what I did. I started to like just talk the way that I talk and just put the emotions behind it. So I think that really... Um, helped me in coming back to myself because I almost 
because I didn't see examples of that. But also about American poetry, when you go to Britain poetry, there's more diversity there. Like when you're reading, because I tend to listen to a lot more poetry than I um, read. But also I'm not just a performance, but I just perform what I've written. I'm a page poet who brings the page up to the stage. So. You know, I'm noted as being a, a very selfish person and I enjoy poetry. I, at some point in my life, wrote it. So I'm hoping that somewhere in this conversation, we can convince you to perform one of your pieces for us. And while you're mulling which piece you might like to perform, um, I, I want to look at the poetry that, you know, it's described, this this particular one, the, the collection that, how to practice forgetting, uh, the poetry that collection that explores the world through the body. Um, this is different. It's just the idea of it is different. And off the Fun top of... Fun fact, yes? it's self-published. Oh, of course it has to be now. Mm -hmm. I, I know where she published it. I know where she's selling it. So it has to be. Mm -hmm. And congratulations for that one. That was a good move. Uh, thank um, you. Experiencing poetry through the human body. There are some places I can think of that experience poetry as, a human being is as far as a human being is concerned. Maybe the skin, the ears. But what was that like? And... Um, is this one of those pieces where you went through it yourself and you thought this is too beautiful to keep? It has to be given to the world. Uh, I actually don't write anything that I don't feel. Like it doesn't have to be my experience, but I have to feel it deeply for me to be able be able to bring it up to stage. So um, yeah, it comes from a place of experience. It also comes from a place of listening and observing others. I think that really helps in uh, writing. Uh, my poetry and about the poetry collection i'm just really fascinated with how we relate to the world how we move around the world so i try to always um look at how my existence in the world also affects others and how other people's existence and how i interact with the, my environment and the things around me and i think everybody moves through the world by experiencing the world through their bodies so it's a very universal experience so how do we practice forgetting uh, yeah, I think that would be the point that I would do. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, maybe we'll keep that answer uh, for the tail end of it. Mm. Um, I, I, I'm still going to explore the concept of forgetting or the act of it because it's not just a concept. Very recently, we had the 10-year anniversary of the Chibok girls' abduction, right? And Radio Now, I mean, we covered it we had conversations on it one of the recurrent things that regular nigerians said to us was that they'd forgotten right that they had moved on with their lives some there was at least one person who said that you know she felt ashamed that she could move on with her life in this way and they couldn't even the ones who survived the ordeal and are back home with their families. So I want you to perhaps speak to us a little more on that, how we are forgetful as a nation, whether it's a deliberate forgetting, right, to sort of cushion ourselves from the reality, or perhaps it's just carelessness. I think it's a very complex answer because there are different reasons for like different people. But I think that it's very human to get desensitized to bad news. That's the only way you can survive. You can't constantly exist in crisis. And in Nigeria, we're constantly exist in crisis. And as a journalist that's covering crisis, everything pops up. I just, was it April? With the, no, sorry, me. Oh, God. March. Uh, there were abductions in Kaduna that I yes. had to cover. I co when I f covered the Kuriga school abduction, I was kind of like experiencing a burnout and then the Buddha abduction happened and then I think like days later there was another abduction that happened and I was so overwhelmed and I just wished that I could just disengage and not even do anything but then I kept telling myself I just kept feeling guilty because if I'm feeling this way then what about the people that are experiencing it and it felt like my guilt had, had no place but there is a place for it because there is what this collective secondhand trauma right you can go through trauma because you're witnessing it um, so yeah, forgetting, I think sometimes it's necessary for people's uh, uh, existence. And after Chibok, how many school abductions have we had? Yeah, Chibok was the biggest. It's kind of like set the... 
kind of said the it was uh, a, a a terrible moment for our yeah. country that was the beginning and we've had repeated i think uh, totally we've had somewhere around 28 school abductions since then and what's interesting is that in speaking of the abductions we forget the atrocity that was committed against the Buniyadi boys who were massacred, yeah. we, we continually forget that. So, you know, perhaps as a nation, we do need to come to a place of deliberate remembrance because yeah. maybe that's the doorway, um, the gateway to fixing these or at least to begin healing. Yes, and I'm really happy that there are people who remember long enough to even talk about it and have anniversaries and have conversations mm -hmm. and still advocate for the rest of the girls that are in... Um, captivity um it, it's very like it's so much layered that sometimes like i understand why it's important to remember but i can also understand why people would choose to forget and i don't think i i can bring myself to hold it against someone though i think we need to practice remembering also apparently we all cope with trauma in different ways some mm. forget some remember yeah, and relive it um what is Let's let's step into back into your creativity. What is your favorite poem of all the ones? I know they are all your babies. You love them wonderfully, but what is your favorite poem? Ah, hmm. uh, this is going to sound cliche, but I don't think I have a, a favorite <laughs> poem. And the reason is because I write at different stages in my life. What matters to me in 2018 may not matter that much to me today. And maybe at 2018 is my favorite poem. Um, I also have a poem that I absolutely love right now. And in the next two weeks, it's, I have something else. Mm. So it just depends on the stage that I am because we keep evolving, we keep changing, we keep, you know, sometimes going backwards. But yeah, change happens. So to stay in the moment, I'm going to ask you, what is that favorite poem that you love right now? And I'm going to ask that you, I, I guess, perform it for us. Or just any poem that comes to that comes out because you are the artist now. Uh, uh, perform. Yeah, I think I'll do how to practice forgetting <laughs> uh, because it's very kind of like... Uh, so how to practice forgetting. One, you breathe through your nose and ignore all the dust it drags along. Two, you cut your memories into little pieces, small enough to slip through your fingers even before you're brief enough to let it go. Three, you allow them to hunt your body. Let the barricades down. Don't try to hide behind the cobwebs. No, not yet. Let every ghost have their turn. So when they come, try to come back, they will remember there is nothing left for them here. Four, start practicing how to throw away scents and ignore the shell of a ghost knocking on your door. Five, when you practice forgetting, you do not fight with memories. You give them space to repair themselves over and over again until they fade away from remembering. Um, you may not be able to talk about favorite poet, uh, poems from your collection, but this is, for me, I think maybe it's at the top for me, from your, your pieces. And I know that you're writing new ones every other day. When we spoke with Helen Habila yesterday, he said that, look, his favorite piece is the most recent one, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever is the most recent book he's written is his favorite book mm. because, you know, it's the newest to him and he's still identifying. So I'm looking forward to that from you. I'm hoping that um, we will get more number poems because that's what the one <laughs> this, 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 two, that, that, that. Maybe you'll start a trend in I Nigeria. I found myself you know? practicing it just now. Like I, see, I sank into Stephen it and I started doing counting. it one after the other. Uh, uh, well, we want to say a big thank you to you. It's such yeah, a pleasure to so speak much with you me. and yeah. for giving us um, the awareness of long COVID and sharing your creativity with us as okay. well. Thank you so much. Our guest, Hawasale, is a poet, a journalist, a lawyer, a tea maker, even though we didn't talk too much about the tea. Stephen, we didn't want to because Stephen will leave the stage now looking for a cup. I'm still going to leave the stage and look for a cup. If I'm you're stopping. just joining us, it's the Cover Fest special here on radio now 95.3 FM Lagos. We're coming to you live from Kaduna City. You are listening to Nabila Usman and Stephen Imelego at Cover Fest. <laughs>